The following production is part of the Play Some Video Games podcast network. Jive turkeys and welcome to Board with Video Games, the gaming podcast that strives for the right balance of coverage for games you play on your table and on your television. You can think of us as the hot chocolate and marshmallows of gaming podcasts. For a proud member of the PSVG Podcast Network, I am one of your hosts, Kyle, and joining me on this co-op adventure, the guy who floats above the fray, no matter how hard I try to pull him down. Josh, how are you doing this evening? I am doing just great. That's pretty how good. <laughs> I'm wonderful. I'm doing really, really awesome. So, number one, you know, you gave me a lot of, uh, gave me a hard time when I called our listeners turkeys. Uh, is jive turkeys better? No, I, I mean, it's probably more problematic than less problematic. Why is it more problematic? <laughs> probably the origin of the, the term. <laughs> oh, man, now I'm going to have to look this up. Did I just use something really <laughs> offensive? I guess I may have without even knowing it. You so should I look want, it up. I am um, looking it up uh, right now. Um, so while well, you look it up, the guy who floats above the fray, no matter how hard I try to pull him down, is that a music reference? It, no, it's not a music reference. What is it from? Um, it is like because I'm saying that you're the you're the marshmallow and I'm the hot chocolate. Oh, I don't put marshmallows in my hot chocolate. Gotcha. Oh my gosh. Okay, so jive turkey is derogatory slang word in African American vernacular English, used to refer to someone who is unreliable, made empty promises, or is full of bluster. Wow. Okay. Well, that was pretty horrible on my part. I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. I don't I'm think horrible. it's. I don't think it's necessarily using that terms anymore. <laughs> yeah. But well, hey. For a funny edit point, if people listen and you edit something else in, <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to edit anything else in because I made a mistake. I should have been more aware. And yeah, I'm. I apologize. That was my bad. I will refrain from using that vernacular in the future. That was 100 percent my bad. So That's there we go. Okay. We learned something new today. We're all learning together and we're growing together. <laughs> so yeah, there we go. So <laughs> I apo- my apologies. Back on though to the hot chocolate talk. Uh-huh. You don't put marshmallows on your hot chocolate ever? No, no, no. No, 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 no. What about whipped cream? Uh, absolutely not. Well, I think it's important for me to tell you I don't like whipped cream. Um, I'm a texture. I know texture is um, a big deal for you person will say um so marshmallows is the same thing for me uh while they start off uh marshmallowy i if if i'm to bite into a marshmallow and it's full of chocolatey liquidy goodness that just ruins my day do you like the flavor of marshmallows i love marshmallows on their own okay like i don't um and i i don't um Two marshmallows over a fire, like every normal person does. So no s'mores if, for you. If it becomes liquid or squishy, I can't. I can't do it. So I need you to like be a solid marshmallow. Peeps, a okay. Interesting. All right. So do you like marshmallow flavored things that are just flavored with like a marshmallow syrup or something? Sure, I wouldn't be mad. We we actually, I just bought today, um, Hershey Kisses with marshmallows inside. Oh, I didn't even know these were a thing. I mean, either I just found them today at CVS, so. I'm excited to try those. That sounds really interesting. I'll be very interested to see what you think of them. All right. So, hey, you know what? This isn't a marshmallow podcast. This is a gaming podcast. So thank you so much for joining us this week. As always, if you have any feedback, questions, or suggested topics, hit us up at Board with VG on Twitter or check out some of the awesome stuff that Josh posts over on the Instagram, also Board with VG. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Board with VG. So feel free to give us a five-star rating over there. And if you want to communicate in the long form, boardwithvg at gmail.com. As always, on all the social medias, use that hashtag boardwithvg so we can follow all the wonderful things you are doing, whether it be gaming or non-gaming related. We like to see what you are doing. And whatever podcast service you are listening to us on, we encourage you to give us a stellar rating, whether that's whether you're downloading us from the PSVG feed or the standalone Board with Video Games feed. We would love and appreciate very greatly if you gave us a wonderful rating. And finally, since the folks over at Make Us Better decided to wind down operations, 
PSVG has launched their own Patreon, and we are very humbled by the amount of support that has been given thus far in just the first couple of days here. Uh, if you like what we're doing, either with at Board with Video Games or PSVG as a whole, feel free to check out patreon.com slash PSVG, and you'll see that we've actually already unlocked all of the goals that we had set, and we are going to be working moving forward to create some new goals and some new things that we want to do with you, the wonderful community. Um, one of the things we were going to talk about this at the end, but I think I'll insert it here now because it seems like it makes sense. Hmm. One of the things that uh, was unlocked or one of the goals that was unlocked is nightly or not nightly, monthly gaming nights. Uh, those are going to be very much run towards or geared towards like the Nintendo Shack, the PlayStation Experience uh, and Xbox are, they're going to take care of like all of those things and they're going to take care of gaming nights on those particular platforms. But Josh and I were talking about what are we going to do for board of the video games? What kind of gaming night do we want to have? Now we want to make sure that we do something in December because the December goal was reached. So we're going to definitely do it this month and it will probably be some sort of console based game for this month. But moving forward, we have talked about, maybe exploring some other options we could do that are a little outside, you know, what the Xbox Empire is going to do or PSXP is going to do. So, Josh, do you feel comfortable? Do you want to jump in and talk about some of the options we've discussed and some things we might look at doing in the future here? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, let's start with um, our very own PSVG uh, Coach Mo uh, mentioned. Uh, he tried to get into a Dungeons & Dragons thing um, when we were with Make Us Better. Didn't work out for him, unfortunately, but... Um, he mentioned doing something like that. So something I talked to Renegade Games about at PAX was this um, RPG called Kids on Bikes, um, which is a kind of introductory RPG where the character creation isn't as uh, in-depth as a normal RPG. Um, and we can run it on um, social medias like Discord or Skype. Uh, and actually, I've reached out to Kids on Bikes podcast for some advice on potentially running that. Uh, we could also look at doing PC-based um, free uh, games, like Star Realms is free. Um, I believe that you can get Ascension for free. Um, there's certainly other games we could find. We could run like Carcassonne on PlayStation, Xbox, or Switch, now that it's on Switch, um, or Mellow. We could do things with phones that's like based on tabletop games where we play tournament style. So really what Kyle and I want to hear from you guys is um, tweet at us or email us. Um, do you want to do these game nights with us? Is that something you'd be interested in? Um, and if so, what would you want to do? Or is this something that you would like to see Kyle and I, like GM, do well, uh, like kids on my bikes game with other play some video games uh, or even fellow podcast networkers um, like do a stream of that would you like to see something like that where we post it to our YouTube or live stream it or something like that once a month so um, you know we do board games I know we're 50 like we're, we try to be 50 50 board games video games but you can go to anywhere else on PSVG to get video games you can't do that with board games so we want to make sure we give you what you guys come for so we're not alienating you guys like away from board games or making you pick between your favorite other podcast and ours um don't be confused by flux to pose uh running a board with video games episode they're posers and they're trying to steal our spotlight <laughs> You heard me, Jason and, and Lucas. You can join us, but you can't be us. Uh, otherwise, yeah, just let us know what you think. And uh, we're excited to do this with you guys. Um, yeah, just know that. It's going to be a lot of work on our end, but it's exciting to either do this with you or do this for you. So let us know what you guys think. Absolutely. And I think the big thing to keep in mind is we want to do whatever's going to be most interesting to you all. And we recognize it's going to be, you know, in some ways it would be saying like, hey, the second Saturday of the month, we're going to play Overwatch on PS4. Is that easy? Absolutely. That's not a problem. I'm probably doing that anyway. But if there's something that you're more interested in, whether it be us running an RPG, us getting down and like learning like Tabletopia or something like that and starting running games that way, uh, we want to do that. We want to do the things that you're interested in and the things you want to see, whether that be with other PSVG folks or with yourselves. So let us know. Please reach out to us. Hit us up on Twitter. Email us at boardwithvg at gmail.com. Let us know 
what those things are that you want to see us do. Like I said, we will do something in December, likely video game related, just to make sure we get something in. But then we're really hoping in January with the new year, we'll have a good plan from based off your feedback, what we feel comfortable doing and, and what we feel we can deliver in a high quality way that all of you will hopefully enjoy. So let us know what you think. So the big plan for tonight is to talk about Josh's wonderful experience about PAX Unplugged. But before we get to that, we have some hot news items to cover. So Josh, what has been some of the hot news in the board gaming world? Well, <clears throat> let's start with something that broke while I was at PAX Unplugged. Uh, and apparently I, j- I, I just missed all of this by minutes. Uh, while the future of Metal Gear video game franchise is up in the air, it seems to have found a new board game home. IDW uh, announced a Metal Gear Solid game at PAX Unplugged, and it's being designed by Emerson Matsuchi, who designed the very Metal Gear feeling game Spectre Ops. Uh, are we excited about a Metal Gear board game? That is our question. Um, I mean, Kyle, are you excited about a Metal Gear board game if it's not a Kickstarter? <laughs> If it's not a Kickstarter, I'm probably more excited about it. Uh, <laughs> but I think I'd be interested to see because I think Spectre Ops, which is a really cool game, I think a lot of people have made the comment it feels like Metal Gear the board game. And there is a Metal Gear board game, if I recall. Maybe uh, Metal Gear. I think some sort of licensed version of a Metal Gear board game exists. But uh, either way, uh, I'm, ex- I'm interested to see what they do. I'm interested to see if Emerson takes specter ops and just layers metal gear on top of it is he going to make something totally different is it going to be you know a hidden movement tactical game is it going to be something more with an overarching story is he going to try to push towards something that has you know almost chapters or something kind of like you know the metal gear games what as you progress through a story what's he really going to look to do here and i'm really interested to see what that game is going to be. We've had more and more video games, it seems, coming to the board gaming world and doing okay. Like the Fallout game people seem to like, the Bloodborne game people seem to think is pretty okay. Like the video game IP seem to be making a pretty solid transition into the board game space. Metal Gear already has, like I said, with Specter Ops, it seems like they got the perfect designer for this game. So I am cautiously optimistic about what the Metal Gear Solid board game might be. How about you, sir? Are you interested in a Metal Gear board game? So to clear it up, there is only one pre-existing Metal Gear board game, and that is Risk Metal Gear Solid. That's what it is. I knew I do. I could. I was like, it's Monopoly was the one that came to mind, but I was like, I know it's something like a name, and then like Metal Gear, but I couldn't remember what it was. So I I literally walked by Emerson while he was taking this photo in front of the Metal Gear um, banner and did not know, was completely oblivious to it. Um, I couldn't find him the rest of the con. We had some listeners asking me to get some info. When I went back to the IDW booth the first time, the IDW employee uh, was too busy talking about driving through New York to acknowledge me. So I left. Uh, and the second time I went back, there was just a guy demoing the Ninja Turtles game. So I couldn't get any info on the game. Um, I, and then, of course, we went back to the hotel and we played Reef, which is also a game done by Emerson, which we had no clue until I was reading <laughs> the title of the box. Um, so he definitely has a... He's very eclectic in his poor game design, which is good. Um, I'm not, I, know, I know the name Spectre Apps. I've never played it. I've only heard great things. Um, but based on how people talk about Emerson, I think it's it's great that they have a very well-known, strong developer on board for this. Uh, if you look at the picture and they stick to that art style, I think it's going to be awesome. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm excited because it doesn't feel like another pasted on um, IP. So I'm excited just for that in general. Uh, I mean, we'll see where it goes from there, but... It sounds promising. It does sound promising. I'm yeah. I'm really interested to see what all you know. Yeah, like because I feel like Emerson probably. I don't know. Maybe you said you really liked Reef. I mean, Emerson also is the person who de- um, designed Century Spice Road slash yeah. Century Calm Edition, which you've heard on this podcast a ton. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so and then like I said, Specter Ops, which is a game that people think is pretty solid overall. That people seem to really enjoy that one. 
I, I'm really interested to see exactly, you know, where this goes and, and what the end result of it is. And I just am trying to figure out, is this going to be, you know, are they going to be basing it very specifically on like, you know, the picture seems like that you're going to be playing as like the, all the Metal Gear characters that we know and love and that they're all going to be involved in the game. Like this doesn't seem like this is going to be some story in the Metal Gear universe. Like this is going to be very much trying to take the, the game experience and, and put it on the tabletop. So I'm very interested to see what he does with this. Yeah, me too. And it's supposedly coming out next year. Yeah, that's great. That's great news. That means he's been working on it for a little bit, which is good. So, good. yes. So not to be out on Upper Deck, uh, you know uh, from Legendary, uh, is adding a different type of spy to their gaming stable. The company announced that they have acquired the rights to James Bond and that we can anticipate a Bond-themed legendary game in the future. Kyle, are you... I'll speak to my um, my thoughts afterwards. Are you excited about reliving Bond movie moments in a deck-building game? I mean, maybe? <laughs> like, I, I, I really wonder, like, what... Number one, I wonder what they're going to do for art. Is it going to be, like, snapshots? Are they going to just be, like, pictures from the movies? Like, what is the art for this game going to be? Which isn't necessarily good or bad. But I just will think it'll be very interesting, like, you know, the idea of the Legendary Games is you're able to take all of these disparate things and put them all together hmm. and, and make this thing happen. But, like, are you going to have to have, like, are you going to be able to have multiple James Bonds? Like, are you going to have, like, the Daniel Craig and the Pierce Brosnan and the Sean Connery, like, all in the same game? And they all have, like, different abilities and things that they do, which would be kind of cool, right? Yeah. Like, it'd be cool if you have the different Bonds and based off who the actor was who's was playing at the at them at the time or him at the time that they had different strengths or different abilities you know pierce brosnan's would just be that he's a good looking dude who made really bad movies uh no okay no <laughs> jokes there okay my my wife adores the pierce brosnan bond movies and i think they are so cheesy like i can't almost handle them they're so cheesy but i really like the daniel craig movies i think the daniel craig movies are great um but yeah so i'm just interested to see how they're going to mix all these things together. I don't think this is going to be a day one purchase for me. I have not seen all of the Bond movies. I've seen a lot of them, many of them only one time with not a huge desire to ever watch them again. But I think it's interesting. I think that they have done a good job taking IPs like Alien and actually the Buffy version of the game like and does some really cool things with that. So I'm interested to see what they do. It's something I'm going to keep an eye on. I don't know if this is a... No, I don't know. This is definitely not a day one purchase for me. What are your thoughts on James Bond in a board game slash deck building game? So I have to address Legendary first before I address the James Bond issue. Uh, They're they kind of one and the same. Here's my worry. Uh, if you look at Legendary's most recent games, mm -hmm. they have just literally just taken stills from the movies as mm -hmm. the card art, and that really worries me. Yep. Um, it's really taking, and I say this as a consumer, not someone in the industry who has any idea how development works, but it really uh, seems like a lazy approach to their previously stellar um, approach at making these games. Um, so first Legendary came out, and if you bought Marvel Legendary, you had all these characters, but then you Wolverine had six different cards, but all the cards had the same art, but they had different effects. And then Legendary addressed that. People complained. So then the next set, or two sets later, every hero had different art for every card, which was awesome. It Made was that awesome. game way better. Yep. And then they started doing Legendary Encounters, which is another great step forward. Different, like, unique settings for games, different ways to play it. They started getting these IPs. Predator, Alien, Serenity, Buffy. Awesome. I love all that. And then they started doing Spider-Man Homecoming, Marvel Phase 1. Just Phase 1 they did. And it was just five Marvel movies. Even though they put Black Panther on the cover, even though they put Guardians of the Galaxy on the cover of the box, not included. Just the basic art from those characters. So I'm not looking forward to the trend. Um, that being said, what I'm worried about James Bond being is just stock photos from James Bond movies for every card. And maybe they do put different James Bonds, but if you're still just playing James Bond, it's not going to matter if you're 
Pierce and Brosnan fighting Jaws, they're not going to care because they're just going to give you the artwork for James Bond. Because it's not James Bond, Pierce Brosnan as James Bond. They're all playing the same character. So why would they, if they didn't have to, why would they differentiate between the characters? Right. But you, as you said, though, for Marvel, they ended up doing that. It's like, hey, it's the same Wolverine, but the cards have different art because they have different abilities. Like, theoretically, it could be the same thing for the Bonds. Like, the different Bonds yes. have different abilities. But Which if they are- did it right, they could do, they do it as an encounters, mm-hmm. and they release expansions. So you have James Sean Connery ones. Right. Playing through the movies, have basically. Roger Moore ones. Um, you could do one for... <laughs> Uh, what's his name? Forgetting his name. Um, and then you could do the Pierce Brosnan ones, and then you could do, like, you could do those as expansions. That would make more sense. Um, I mean, I get with James Bond, maybe they don't do art because it's not based on a comic book like Marvel was. Um, but even the Predator one, you're not getting stills of Arnold Schwarzenegger. You're getting art. Do you think the reason for something compared to Bond versus even Predator? Yeah. Do you think that the average Bond fan is going to be much more likely to buy this game if it does have stills from movies rather than hand-drawn art created Mm -hmm. for the game versus the Predator fan? Maybe, I mean, and again, no information to support this other than maybe gut instinct. Maybe they're going to be more okay with the comic book world or hand-drawn than maybe the average James Bond fan would be. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you're a collector and you're not into board games, you're going to want to get a board game that has uh, Bond photos in it over art um but if you're a board gamer i don't think that matters um but that's me as like a casual bond fan not a diehard right um i just i don't know i just worry about quality and we've seen companies buy ips before and just put out ip games um i don't want to name companies but if you if you're in the board game world you know there's at least two specific companies that just like to buy movie ips and pop out games that are are not good um i just worry about being cash grab more than a more than an experience so with the other ones that you talked about like how predator and mm. alien and stuff like that they you know they bought these ips or the rights to these ips and put out good games yeah why would this be any different no you're right and i'm being skeptical <clears throat> which is fine as a consumer it's yeah. healthy to be skeptical for sure i'm being skeptical just based off of their last two games they put out Gotcha. No, that makes sense. So what would it take for you or what is the situation where you would pick up a Bond version of Legendary? A, or new, Legendary sy- a new system. Oh. Like if, if they came out and they said, we're still using, not a whole, not redefined, but like we're still using Legendary Encounters as you know it. However, we've added all these different mechanics to show you that we've put in the work to make this work with James Bond. Because you could buy... Um, this pack separately that allows you to play alien and Marvel legendary. That's them. Like, I don't want that. I'm not buying legendary alien encounters to play against captain America. I don't, or like Loki is the villain. And all of a sudden the queen is a good guy fighting against Loki. Like that to me seems like they're trying too much, too hard. Give me a, give me a James Bond game that, they're saying we're committing to this James Bond theme by changing these things. And we're not going to mix it with Marvel. You know, we're not trying to keep it so similar that it can just flow into the Marvel design. All right. So final question then, sir. We, you know, we hear about, and I feel like recently for sure, a lot of our board game news has been talking about companies who have obtained IPs that are releasing games Mm. now. You know, it seems like that's what we're doing a lot of these days. We don't know much about the Metal Gear Solid game. We have the Bond game, which we have an idea maybe of what gameplay might be like or or kind of how this game might feel based off of a track record of games, at least in that that are using similar mechanisms. Right now, what game are you more excited for between the two of them? I mean, Metal Gear, 100%. (laughs) Even though you know almost nothing about what it's going, it's literally nothing about what it's going to actually play like. Yeah, but I know, we know what the designer is and... And um, yeah, honestly, uh, uh, point taken, if it was a different designer who I didn't know, I, I probably would be more excited for Legendary because I know that I know Legendary. That's okay. Metal Gear. I'm more excited for Metal Gear as well. So yeah. awesome. All right. Well, that's some of the hot board game news, but no worries. We will definitely be back with more board game info in not too long because we have so much to talk about from PAX Unplugged. Mm. 
But let's transition briefly to video game news. There were definitely some bigger stories than what we're going to cover uh, in our, you know, quaint little show. There's some bigger stories in this, but I feel a few other podcasts might be a little more geared towards handling, like the Nintendo Shack could probably talk about the Nintendo getting rid of the creators program a little better than we can mm-hmm. conveniently right before Smash comes out. Uh, <laughs> the, that's something that they could talk about and address much better than we'd be able to. So I just picked a couple of things that I thought would be a little eh, fun to have some conversations about. First one being, while a ton of big AAA games released this fall, there are a few games aiming to kind of fill a niche that is that have released as well. You know, when you're listening to this, uh, Just Cause 4 will have just come out. But one of those games as well is Darksiders 3. And it appears that Darksiders 3 really struggled, at least in the UK. For the week ending December 1st, which represented the Darksiders 3 release week, the game placed at number 32 in the physical (laughs) games chart. So it was the 32nd best-selling game of the week, the week it came out. Reviews for the game have been mixed, Josh. Hmm. But these seemingly poor sales, what is it, what, what's going on here? Is this a sign of just a poor game? Is it poor marketing? Is it a poor release window? What's going on here? And does this game, which a lot of people have kind of talked about, you know, THQ Nordic maybe resurrecting the double A space, does the sales of this game maybe put the brakes on that a little bit? What do you think? Uh, so there's no doubt it's, a poor release window. I don't think that's even arguable based on uh, Black Friday just having happened, Smash Brothers coming out Friday, Christmas on on the horizon. Um, I think the marketing has been terrible for this game. Uh, In fact, I don't think a lot of people even knew it was coming out now. Uh, Obviously, there's a huge fan base who are passionate about Darksiders that knew this game was coming out. But otherwise... There hasn't been a lot of talk. Uh, they clearly didn't give out at least too much, too many pre-release copies of the games because I didn't see it streaming anywhere. I didn't see anything pop up on YouTube, and and like that's where everything goes now for on YouTube is you can't avoid game previews, game pre-release, game whatever live streams. I didn't see anything for it. In fact, I saw more for this game last year than I saw for it this year personally. Um, so I'm going to say I think it's the marketing um, tied in with I, – I think the marketing is just as responsible for the release window as the publisher is. So um, I think it's like the imperfect storm of bad press. What about, what, do, what about you? What do you think? You know, I think this is a really interesting thing to think about. And I don't have this game yet. I do want to play it, but – It's my backlog is so big right now. I just couldn't justify, you know, spending $60 on a game that I wasn't going to get to for months. You know, it's not in a situation where I was going to play this game day one. I will hopefully eventually play it because it sounds cool. Like I enjoy the Darksiders games. I think they're fun. Uh, This one sounds like it's a little more Metroidvania-y than it is Zelda inspired, which Mm -hmm. is fine. I'm totally down with that. I'm totally cool with that. I wonder though, what I think for me, this keeps going back to what the world is THQ Nordic doing? (laughs) <laughs> like, what is their plan? Like, what? how much money are they spending? How much money are they making? You know, we look at, like, Biomutant that's supposed to come out next year, which looks cool. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like you're a cool mutant guy running around with the sword and stuff. Like, that's awesome. But, like, what? what's their plan? They supposedly have, like, 60 games in development right now. How much money are they sp- spending on each of these games? You know, and it sounded like I listened to an interview with the director of this game on Game Informer's podcast. And it was interesting, really interesting listening to him talk about how, you know, the budget for this game is less than the previous Darksiders games, it sounds like. And he made the comment about, you know, coming out in a year where you have a game like God of War, who, you know, like one cuts, he said something to the effect of, and obviously the numbers aren't exact, and it's probably a bit of hyperbole, but that basically like one cut scene for that game probably was more than the entire budget of Darksiders 3. Yeah, but you can't use that as an excuse to no absolutely absolutely uh, not i'm not i'm not saying that at all but i think he can't he can't use that as an excuse right and his thing was his thing was that it's hard coming out in a year knowing you're going to be compared to that that's all he was saying not that it made it okay that how the game's going to review or anything like that but just as a game director you work with the resources you have you know and you know you do the best you can with what you have and that was nerve-wracking for him Sure, sure. So it was just really interesting to listen to it. And actually in listening to that, it made me want to play the game more. 
because I felt like I had some whatever some connection to this director now. <laughs> like I felt like you know, oh, he's so passionate about this game, and oddly enough, he had worked on the other two games as well. Um, but yeah, so I just think it's really interesting, and I wonder if you know THQ Nordic games keep coming out and keep selling like this. Hmm. Is THQ Nordic just going to become THQ? You know, like are they going to go the way that THQ did? Or and, Telltale? Or Telltale? You know, are, is there a market for the the double A space? We often lament the double A space going away, but can that market be supported anymore? You know, is there too much good stuff on the top? And I don't want to say the bottom, as in that indie games are like lower quality or like aren't deserving of our time, but from a budget perspective, it's either a huge budget or a very small budget and anything else in between is just going to get missed because it's not going to make enough money to make up that middle-sized budget, whereas a low-budget game can make up enough and the big-budget game that everyone's interested in and buys, you know? Right. So, and especially with how long games are getting now, you know, Darksiders 3, single player, no microtransactions, no multiplayer, no additional way to extend, really, the life of this game. You can buy, like, a super special edition of it, but there's nothing else there. You know, it's nothing to ask more of your time once you've beaten the game. So I hope it does well. You know, like I said, I haven't played it and it's more for me just a business thought process than it is a, is this game good or bad? But I really wonder what, if any impact this is going to have on THQ Nordic moving forward. Yeah. So, yeah. so they, there, if you didn't know dark siders three is out, it's out, check it out. Some <laughs> people liked it. Some people did not. I think game informer gave it like an eight out of 10 and game spot gave it a four out of 10. That's, too much of a difference. So, <laughs> so there you go. So that's that's Dark Sider three. The next question, the next news story: What is Rocksteady making? The developer famous for the Batman Arkham series has been quiet since 2015 when they released Batman Arkham Knight. Part of the studio obviously worked on and put out Batman Arkham VR, but it sounded like that was kind of a side project within the studio, and other folks were working on other things. But ever since that Arkham Knight released. Everyone's kind of been wondering, what's next for Rocksteady? Supposedly, Arkham Knight was the end of the Rocksteady trilogy for the Batman games, and they claimed they were moving on to something different. And a lot of people thought that that was going to mean Superman. But Rocksteady game director Sefton Hill said on Twitter recently, quote, looking forward to the Game Awards this year. We're still hard at work in our development bunker, so don't expect an announcement from Rocksteady Games. When it's ready to show, you'll be the first to know. Spoiler, it's not Superman. So Josh, wild speculation is a whole bunch of fun. What's Rocksteady working on? I'm going to stick with what I heard a couple months back. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, while they're technically not lying, I think it's a Justice League game that that was that was rumored uh, briefly. Um mm-hmm. But I think the fact that it was rumored briefly and then shut down is a bigger sign that it actually is being at, like it is happening. Right. Because we would have just kept hearing rumors that they're doing Justice League. Um, typically, when something like that leaks and it gets shut down, it usually has some type of truth to it. Uh, and and them saying it's not Superman, I think, is kind of like a wink to everyone who's wondering. Like they're like, it's not Superman. It's all of them. Like that's how like they'll, <laughs> they'll say it when it comes out. Um, it's not going to be another Batman because they've done what they needed to do with Batman. I think it proves to everyone that we can trust them with any IP. Um, but if they use that Batman system or even take the Spider-Man system and tweak that, which was tweaked from Batman to make a Justice League game, uh, I think they have all of the makings of what needs to be like the first technically successful Superman game plus um, you know, it's not going to save the DCEU, but um, um, I think that I think it's going to be Justice League. I mean, who knows what it could be anything, but I'm going to stick with Justice League. OK, what it could you... be anything. It definitely could be anything. <laughs> the thing, the rumor that I've always been quite partial to, and it's not because I keep up with this IP anymore, but it still probably is the biggest like soft spot from my childhood. Man, if they were making a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, that would be awesome. That I would be one hundred percent down for that. That would be so cool. I mean, and I know they're named after a character from Ninja Turtles, <laughs> right? I mean, I yeah, exactly. I mean, I would really <laughs> that would be great. And again, that was one of the rumors that was out there a while ago that that was the game they were working on. And I think the Justice League one seems to be um, the more prevalent one because Warner Brothers obviously is more interested in in that IP right now than they are the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 
you know, and with the Justice League one, there was lots of talks of it being, and I know Destiny like, and I know that some folks don't like, you know, every game being compared to Destiny and what does a shared world, you know, mean and all those things. But that was the yeah. common phrase that's used for it. So that would be cool. I think it'd be fun to, you know, be a superhero running around in a, in a area with a whole bunch of other superheroes and living that out. But for me, I really would love it if it was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. Uh, and being able to play it four-player co-op, like how sweet would that be? I know they said they won't be at the Game Awards, but this is what I picture. Uh, if it's Ninja Turtles, right? So if they cut to a teaser, it's just a black screen, and then literally Rocksteady walks out into the middle of the screen, and he stops, and he looks at the camera, and then the Rocksteady logo smashes him off the screen, and then it just sits there, and then it cuts to black. And that would be it. sweet. That would be super. <laughs> you should work at marketing, so Josh. Picture. On this. That's what I'm sure. on this. Um, and obviously the other thing that, well, actually I'm going to transition really quick. Anything else about this story you want to talk about? No, I mean, I'm excited for whatever they do. Uh, if it's just like awesome. If it's not, give me more rock steady. I just love everything they've done. I agree. Whatever they're going to put out next, I'm interested in. So really quick before we go to pack some plug, um, mm. the day everyone is listening to this is the day the game awards happen. Yeah. So two things I want to ask about the Game Awards real quick. Number one, what do you think of this trend to announce that you're not going to be at the Game Awards? It's stupid. Because like Rocksteady <laughs> did it. Naughty Dog did it. Like we're starting to see people who are like, we're not going to be there. Who like, cares? don't. That's what I think. Who cares? I know who you're cares? not a fan of the Game Awards. but No, I, no, I like the Game Awards. I'm a fan of the Game Awards. Okay. Who cares that you're announcing you're not going to be somewhere? Do you think it's an effort to try to help people enjoy the Game Awards better in the sense of, I'm not sitting there waiting for The Last of Us Part 2 trailer because I know it's not going to happen. So I'm not going to be disappointed in the show if the thing I was hoping was going to be there isn't there. That makes sense. If you want to like temper the expectations of your audience, I suppose that's fine. I don't know if that's more like Jeff Keighley asking them to do that or them just saying... Getting so many tweets at them that they're like, (laughs) listen, we're not going to be there. Uh, I guess okay. Well, when you put it that way, I think, I think it's fine. Um, I don't, but like, I I go to the game. I watch the game awards, which I do enjoy. Um, but I go into it not knowing anything. It's not like E three. Like I'm mm-hmm. not watching a Nintendo press conference. So like, if Nintendo shows up at the game awards, I think that's cool. But I'm not necessarily expecting. I'm not expecting specific companies. I am expecting world premieres, which is what. They promise every year and they deliver every year and it gets better and better every year. Uh, trailers, the presentation is not great. Um, and I get more and more nervous the more celebrities they announce to be yeah. presenters. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that aspect because we all saw what happened last year with the No Way Out guy and they have no control over. He's coming back, a way out guy, Joseph Ferris. So they have clearly had no control over their interviews. Um, so that worries me, but I'm all on board for more game releases. Hans Zimmer's going to be there. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to perform with the orchestra, right? Or conducting the orchestra or doing something with the orchestra. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. They did, um, they did okay last year. It was either last year or the year before. There was a really weird, too long musical performance. Maybe mm-hmm. it was two years ago. It's like a rap group that just didn't fit in with what they were doing. Um, maybe it was last year. I can't remember. Anyways, at least for me, there was something weird that happened musical performance wise. So they they try to make it like uh, like the Emmy Awards, so yeah. like, like putting music in with like live performance and stuff. I think Kanzimer fits more the bill, like orchestral instead of like. Was it I, man? What year was it? Oh man, that they did wasn't that the Game Awards where they had a live performance of the Doom soundtrack? Yeah, I think that was like. That might have been last year. Yeah, I I honestly thought that was really awesome. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. So, okay, real quick. I know you said that you don't have, like, thoughts about it necessarily. Do you have anything, predictions, really briefly, one or two, that you would think will happen or would like to see happen at the Game Awards that you think would be fun? Not that, like, oh, this would make the broadcast for me, but be like, hey, this would be a fun way to end the year. <laughs> well, so I saw the Russo brothers were going to be there, so I thought we were going to get the Avengers trailer at the Game Awards, but now it's premiering tomorrow morning. So right. that was really the only thing I thought we were going to get. Uh, I would love to see a Hellboy trailer. I don't know if they're going to try to incorporate some um, movie stuff in there. 
Um, but if we see more Death Stranding, I'm going to be mad. What if you get... <laughs> have you heard there's this rumored Death Stranding release date? A release date, I guess, is fine. But if I have to watch another 12-minute weird video... Well, I mean, it's Kojima and Jeff Keighley. Of course you're going to watch a 12-minute weird video. It's not like... I don't mind watching like a 12-minute weird Metal Gear video because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sold on the franchise. I'm really not sold on the baby carrying. Like it feels like it's um, like an escort mission for the whole game, and yeah. it's like my least favorite type of game. So, <laughs> I understand that. We'll see. Uh, what about you? Do you have anything you're excited to see? I mean, the things that I would like to see, like okay, I would love to know if this you know Death Stranding rumor of it's there, and then there's a June release date. Like that'd be cool. Crash Team Racing supposedly is going to be there. Uh, also, with, yeah, also with the June release date. So we'll see if that happens. Uh, Metroid Prime 4 is supposedly going to be there. So we'll see if that happens along with a Metroid Prime. Is that what it is? I don't even, I've never played these games. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> Trilogy being announced for Switch. So that would be kind of cool because I've never played them. So I'd like to. Um, I think for me, the two things that I would like to see or would be nice to have is if they announce the Dreams beta because they have still been saying that Dreams is coming this year. The beta is still going to be this year. So I'm hoping that the Dreams beta happens and that it's like, hey, it's now or it's like next week. Right. Uh, so that would be cool. And the other thing I'm hoping for is remember a few months ago when we had that leaked trailer for that Harry Potter game? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would. I really hope that we actually see that trailer uh, at the Game Awards. It seems like a good fit for that. That's true. That would be a good fit. I'd like to see the Avengers Square Enix game too. Yep, that would be cool. I would definitely be down for that. Harry Potter one, though. I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping that that yeah. one happens. But like I said, if it does it, that's fine. I, I enjoy being surprised. And obviously, I would take a Bayonetta trailer, too. That'd be sweet. Okay. But that's <laughs> enough video game talk. We talk a lot about video games. So, hey, Josh, uh -huh. you went to PAX Unplugged 2018. I did. <laughs> this is this was the second PAX Unplugged. You uh -huh. have been to both. So, you have 100% attendance. Good job. Thank you. So... <laughs> The rest of the show is really just going to be us talking about your experiences at PAX, Un PAX Unplugged. So to start with, number one, uh, initial impressions and how would you compare it to the 2017 show? Okay, so um, initial impressions. Let's start with that. Um, it was more of the same, which is a good thing. Uh, the Expo Hall, they rearranged it, and it was um, bigger. So last year, the Expo Hall... Um, also had the main theater in it. So that took up a big chunk of um, Expo Spike vendor space. So this year they moved the main hall above the main entrance, which freed up so like crazy amount of space. So they were double the amount of vendors this year. And instead of walking right into the vendor hall, when you walk in the main doors, you, the first thing you see are hundreds of empty tables in the tabletop free play area right when you walk in and then all the vendors are off to the left which is a, which is a good that's a good change because it's not all right in your face right away and you kind of get to see just how much space is available not to mention the first look area was i want to say easily five times bigger than it was last year um so this is all games that were at essen that aren't out yet some games that are available um but um, their first look like, area had like Pandemic, Fall of Rome, um, Comanauts, uh, Gen 7, a lot of these games that aren't aren't out yet and won't be out for a little bit. So um, that area was nice. Um, all that was different from last year. The big difference for the con, well, they didn't have the Philadelphia Marathon there this year. Mm -hmm. So... Instead of the tabletop tournament area, which was also in the main hall, they were actually below in space just as big as the vendor show floor. So the tabletop area had thousands of tables for tabletop tournaments. And they had vendors down there too for sale, but that's where everything was. Every tournament from Magic to Keyforge to Ticket to Ride to Splendor. Like they had their own space, which was awesome because it really helped with a, um, people management. It wasn't as crowded, even though there was twice as many people, twice as many vendors. It didn't feel like that. In fact, Friday was still such a chill, low-key day that you could literally just walk around and talk to anybody you wanted to and almost play any game you wanted to without any weight, so, which was awesome. So really quick, just to clarify a couple of things. Number one. 
as this is your two, do you think the increase in both vendors and space and attendees <laughs> is because it's the second year or because it wasn't the same week as Board Game Geek Con this year? I think it's both. Um, I think um, based on people that you that I talked to and vendors and stuff, it sounds like, I mean, it's impossible to tell, but so many people, like, if I could tell you everyone from last year came this year, I would tell you that. I know it's not true. But yeah, um, um, Stephen Bonacore was there. Like a lot of the people who were at BGGCon last year were there this year. Um, Ultra Pro was there this year. So um, the people who make you know Ascension were there and they were not there last year because of BGGCon. So we get a lot more vendors, Plaid Hat, um, stuff like that. So I think that it kind of worked out to both people's advantage. I don't think if there were complaints about last year, there were a few, and they I would imagine they were addressed. I didn't have any issues. Uh, if you go on the internet, you can hear a lot of people complaining about them adding bad sh- bag checks and metal detectors, and you're going to hear about people saying, uh, it didn't matter, they didn't check my bag thoroughly enough. Um it's just there for peace of mind. Well, if it was there for peace of mind, great. I think it was necessary. I Last year, I immediately made note that they did not have any security. So t- t- on Saturday, yeah, we waited in line for 30 minutes to get in. That stunk. But we, were, we went to a side entrance. Apparently, if we went to the main entrance, there was no wait to get in. So it's just about reading PAX lines, their Twitter, going to the right line. And I just, I just don't know why people can't be respectful of these situations. Children are coming to these events. If you don't think someone checked your bag well enough, well, one, you don't work security. Two, maybe they didn't, but it's going to deter someone from trying to bring something in. They shouldn't be because their bags are getting checked. So I'm very frustrated with my Pax Unplugged um, Facebook group because... So many people are being negative about it. I applaud PAX for doing what they did. Do it again next year. Do it every year. Security checks is a necessity, unfortunately, in the times that we're living in. So to clarify, were people frustrated because security checks existed or because they existed and they didn't think they did a good enough job? They were mad because they had to wait. Okay. Yeah. And and um, and the people complained People who are waiting, so they have to find a reason to complain. So they complained that they didn't think they were doing a good enough job. Okay. You know, they we had to open up our bags. We had to take everything out of our pockets. They looked in our bags just as good as a, a, a concert checks your bags. Like, of course, if you're hiding something in there, it is possible for you to get something in. Do I want to be around you if you're bragging about you could have snuck something in if you wanted? No, I want to. I want to go rat you out and say this person said they could have got a gun in. Like, why talk about stuff like that? Just go on. You're in now. Go have a fun day. Don't complain about bag check. Like, I don't know. That's my that's my two cents about that. Like, it didn't bug me. They should have had it last year. Every other convention is going to have it next year. So get used to it, people. <laughs> Indeed. So compare a little bit. Do you think that this experience this year was a better experience than your experience last year? And why or why not? Yeah, it was a better experience. Um They do need to get some more food vendors in. There's only about four little food stands inside the convention, very, very tiny ones. Um, And there's a coffee shop outside that everyone goes to. However, I mean, it's surrounded by food outside. So when you go to get lunch, you you have to leave the area if you don't want to spend $16 on a salad at the Hard Rock Cafe uh, below the convention center. But um, overall, everything was better. Um, The presence was better. The vendors were better. The um, the things you could buy were better. The, the organization was better. Like everything has improved over last year, a one hundred percent. Nothing that we experienced <coughs> was worse than last year. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to jump really quick to a some listener questions because I have some other other questions as well. But I want to make sure we get these listener questions in since they were kind enough to you know <laughs> hit you up and ask you about your experiences at Pax Unplugged. So, of course, super listener, listener, Splig, at Dopalicious on Twitter. Number one, who is your favorite person to meet? Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, the Dice Tower people are always super nice to meet. Um, I met, I actually had a conversation with Suzanne. She was very nice. 
as well. Um, but we met, we sat down and we met um, Stephen, Steve Finn, who is, um, does Dr. Finn's games. Uh, if you Google him, you'll know his games, uh, most likely. We got to meet him on Thursday night through um, friends we made last year uh, who do the Gameosity uh, website. And um, we played some of his prototype games at a party Thursday night, and we visited his booth on Friday. She's a super nice guy, uh, very down to earth, um, willing to come on and be a guest on our podcast. Um, uh, he was just a great guy. He was really nice to me, um, very personable, very smart, uh, very fun. So I, I would say he was my favorite person to me. Awesome. All right. So biggest surprise game. Biggest surprise game. Let me look at my list of games so I can tell you because we played so much. Um, <laughs> okay, so there's this game. It's called Dice Fishing, Roll and Catch. And I saw Tom do an unboxing of it at one point. I'm trying to, I'm like looking on my shelf right now, trying to locate it so I can tell you who made it. And <laughs> you talk about it, I'll look it up. I just don't know where I put it. <laughs> um, it is this game. It looks so simple. It doesn't look impressive when you look at it. Um, you are rolling dice. It, it's a multiple player game and you have shields. If you're familiar with um, game shields for maybe like hidden movement games or even like uh, RPGs have them, you have six um, D6s and then you have a D8 and a D20 and you're hiding them behind the shield. And in front of you is a deck of cards. You flip over the top deck and it has a fish. You're literally fishing. Um, and it has a number on it. And then sometimes they'll have special um, um, requirements to catch this fish. Like one was like all all prime numbers. like And it was like a 13. So you have to roll um, this number to catch this fish. And, and you're bidding on how many dice you want to roll. And everyone's secretly bidding. And then everyone shows their dice at the same time. And the person who bid the lowest amount of dice to catch... The fish uh, will roll first, but you also have special dice, which you can only use once per turn. And then they have a cooldown, which is a full turn. So if you use it, you can't use it for another full turn. If you have special dice, you get to roll before people who don't have special dice. And then you get to choose how you want to use the dice. You can use the dice as a lure, which lets you either lower or raise a die you rolled by one pip. Or use it as a reroll, which which lets you reroll all your dice, or you use it as a regular roll, and you just use the number it gets. And you're just competitively trying to catch these fish. And if no one catches them, they stack on top of each other, and then whoever catches it, they get all of the fish underneath it. Very simple game. I my wife didn't want to play it, so she stood behind me and watched. I had such a fun time, mostly because my rolls were incredible and I won the game. <laughs> Uh, super easily i crushed the guy showing us the game and another guy who sat down to play with us uh so, i had such a fun time okay so it looks like it's by uh march hair games or homo sapiens lab one of the two of those is the publisher in the u.s i don't know which one okay. i haven't heard of either of those publishers they were under the flag of a of a of an asian company yeah because uh, uh homo sapiens lab is a taiwanese company where the heck did i put it oh man it's bumming me out that i can't I went. I put all my stuff away yesterday. Oh, it's right here. Um, yeah, it's it's under Homo Sapien Lab. Okay. Um, but they were under a different um, banner at. Uh, but listen to this. It's so, oh, it sounds it sounds so good. I love the sound of this. Um, they were under this company of like Korean games or Asian games. Like uh, they had this whole flag where they show they were showcasing a bunch of their games. Yeah. Well, I mean, it probably. I mean. The other publisher, March Hare Games, the reason it's called that is because the owner was born uh, during March in the year of the rabbit. Okay. There so you go. either one, probably. So 20 bucks. Uh, I give it a super high recommendation. It's very fun, uh, easy to learn. And uh, even if people can't get behind the fishing aspect, I think it's still a great concept for a game. Awesome. His next question, favorite takeaway? Favorite takeaway. Okay. Well, you know, what is my favorite takeaway? Um, my favorite takeaway is how approachable everybody is at PAX Unplugged. It is like 
meeting, it's like playing games with your best friend, but everyone is your best friend. Everyone is super nice. The guys from Shut Up and Sit Down games, like Quinn, they're just walking around. You can just go up and say hi. We were in the first look area playing a game. I looked across. Tom Vassell is just sitting down playing a game with people. And he was there for like an hour and a half playing this one game with them. Um, the vendors, everyone, super approachable. Um, so yeah, I mean, my takeaway is like, it, it packs on blood is like family board game, like every day, all day. It was so, it's just, it was so much fun. Awesome. His next question, can you compare it to a video game conference? Yeah. I mean, it's comparable to PAX East or PAX West or PAX South because Penny Arcade uses the same formula for everything they do, which is a good thing. Um, the only difference is that PAX East or the other ones there, the board game area is, uh, it, it pales in comparison to the video game area. Um, so it's comparable to any other PAX uh, convention. I can't necessarily, if you ever went to like a comic book convention, not like a Comic-Con, but like a smaller one, it's comparable to that as well, except way more you know interactive excellent let's uh let's talk about some other fun topics here before we wrap things up for the evening um how many i asked you i think in the discord how many yeah. games did you play while you were there you asked me mid aeg game night so i didn't know if you were asking how many games had i played that yeah. night Just in um, your entire time at pax unplugged how many games did you play so i made up my list today uh we played 21 games Okay. All right. I, I didn't, and Ashley played another, Ashley played Evolution. I didn't put that on the list because I didn't play it. So 22 games between us. Um, we could have played more, but we did a lot of um, eating. So perfect. Before we get to the games, then final two questions before we just talk about games. Number one, did you go to any of the shows? You know, you know, it's really funny. I Before PAX, you, they have this app, the PAX app, where you can schedule all the shows you want to go see, all the talks. So I scheduled all these talks, planning on like, if I didn't want to go, I would just ignore it. You can set notifications. This year I set notifications, not realizing the default time was 15 minutes. So you, there's lines that queue hours before. And the one thing I wanted to do was the Dice Tower. And they actually did change it back to a top 10. Mandy and Suzanne stayed out. Okay. So they did end up doing their top ten, top ten games of the year. I was very upset that I got a notification fifteen minutes before the panel, so we didn't get to it. But uh, it's a good thing because we had so much fun playing games. We didn't even realize uh, we didn't go to anything. Okay. Every time, every time I got a notification, we were playing a game. There you go. So I was okay with that. All right, and then best thing you ate while you were there. So we ate. At this place called Yamatsuki. I didn't know anything about it except um, Jess Fisher uh, at Mini Kitty, Mini Kitty on um, Instagram. She works on Gameosity with her husband. She posted a picture of uh, herself drinking a pear lager. And I was like, I got to try that. Where is that? She said, it's at Yamatsuki, right across the street from the convention. So my wife and I walked in there at noon, walked right in, and it was a ramen bar i've never had proper ramen in my life um it's so of course i got the spicy ramen (laughs) it's so good i love Uh, ramen it was incredible uh this poor guy one guy working in the bar for the whole restaurant and serving he was nonstop. uh the service was slow but of course it was so we didn't hold that against him in fact i wanted to tip him more because he was still super nice and friendly um, it was such an incredible, it was an experience. It was such an incredible experience trying this food. Half of the ramen bowl is food I've never like eaten or like tried with other things. So soft boiled egg, all this stuff that was in there. Um, I tried, I tried a new Japanese beer. I tried, um, a grape wine beer. I've tried so much stuff there my wife had her own ramen it was awesome what a great experience that was awesome all right so you played 21 slash 22 games yes <laughs> you don't we don't have time to hear about all of them today but no, the cool thing don't. is is you basically have like the games to talk about for like the next like four to eight weeks like set for yourself which is pretty know, cool right? <laughs> that's pretty great why don't you pick a few handful at the most just take us through some of the games you played that you really enjoyed 
Well, I mean, we'll start. We can just start on Thursday. So we got there on Thursday and um, we get there early. It was a long drive. Checked in on the hotel and we knew there was the first, you know, the first ever gaming cafe, board game cafe in New England or not New England, in the Northeast and in Philadelphia for certain. So we looked and it was within walking distance. It was a little chilly, but we walked um, and we got there and it was very chill, very quiet. I had my first ever latte. I'm now a latte drinker. I never thought I'd ever say that. Oh, you had your first ever latte? <laughs> yeah, I hate coffee, so I pretty much never drink coffee. Um, I started drinking cold brew this past year, and I and the, it's just so I get it black, so it's like I sip it and I'm like, <laughs> I was like, you hate coffee, and then you start with cold brew. I know, right? <laughs> well, I think like, I go like, I hate, it's like, being like I hate beer and drinking like the darkest beer you can yeah. for the first beer you choose. Yeah. Exactly. I just okay. wanted to put the caffeine up right away. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we got we got a latte. We sat down. We had a couple. We had a beer. The latte was at the end. Um, we had some beers, and you know we checked out some games. We didn't know what we wanted to play. So we picked up Topiary because it's by Renegade Games. We've been looking at Topiary forever. Um, we learned that game. Uh, it's a pretty uh, daunting game. It doesn't. It looks um, easy. Uh, from the cover, and it's a small box game. Uh, but essentially, you're building, um, you're starting off on this five by five grid, and then the middle is a topiary, and you're building different size topiaries, and they are in range from height from one to five. And it's kind of like photosynthesis. If you can't see behind something, you don't score points for that, and you're scoring points based on your character's sightline and what they can see. And you can't be in someone else's sightline. So you also have to work around if they're looking diagonal, you can't be in that sightline. Um, and you're basically scoring points after that. So that was a pretty fun game. Um, we also played Onitama while we were there. That's a game I've talked about before. We played, we just wanted to play something familiar. Um, then that night we went to the um, Philadelphia um, uh, local theater PAX meetup. And it was at a bar. And we played Pandemic Rising Tide with our friends from Gameosity and Stephen from Dr. Steve and Dr. Finn Games. Um, that was pretty interesting. Uh, the whole board is in a different language on purpose. The rules are in English, but because of the country that you're in, you're actually playing in the local country's language. So trying to tell someone to go somewhere and do something is difficult. <laughs> Um, but essentially, you're shoring up dams, uh, trying to prevent this continent you're on from flooding. Uh, as the flood ri waters rise, you have roles very similar to Pandemic, um, where they do different things, but very similar to like the medic, the researcher, the dispatcher. You can send people different places. Um, you build water pumps to lower the water levels. You build pump stations where you can travel back and forth instead of headquarters. Um, that was fun, challenging. We did win, uh, so we had a good time with that. We then played two prototype games from Dr. from Stephen, um, Cog and Curio. He has a big box version of Cog already available to buy, but um, the, this smaller version of Cog he's putting out on Kickstarter. I want to say this month, maybe next month. Um, that was really fun. Um, I posted some pictures uh, on our Instagram, well, on my Instagram, tagging us. Um, those games are fun. I won't talk too much about them because they were prototypes. Uh, Skybound did announce on Friday a new Walking Dead game. Uh, not only did they announce it, but they had it playable at their booth, which I did not expect at all. They also had Tidal Blades playable. Um, I got to meet James Hudson, the guy who created Tidal Blades, and the guy who pretty much runs the board games uh, through Skybound. Super nice guy. <laughs> Uh, we went through a brief walkthrough of The Walking Dead, Something to Fear. The art is all based off of the comic book, not the TV show. And it's a deck building uh, sort of game where you're killing and acquiring characters to your hand with the intention of um, getting higher score than your opponent. Uh, you can also like give zombies to your opponent. 
Um, if you kill Negan, there's like a thing like you get 20 points, but if you've killed him twice, you get like minus 20 points. He has a scale on the bottom of his card. So the number of times you've defeated him in the game alters the way the points work, as well as like um, some of the zombies and other characters through the game. Um, I really love the art for the game. It was very, like, very eye catchy. Uh, and that's coming out next year. Uh, I think February, m- February, March. I'm actually just, I'm just going down my list. We played Reef in the hotel that night, and that's by Emerson. And uh, it's kind of a game that I just kind of always wanted to get um, because we love playing B games. You know, it's Azul, essentially. Well, not Azul, essentially. It's people who made Azul. Um, <clears throat> it is this challenging reef building game. You are uh, drawing cards that have you draw specific tile, uh, not tiles, pieces of reef. There's different colors, purple, yellow, red, green, uh, and I'm forgetting one of the colors, um, yellow. And you're placing them on this board and you can also stack them higher and lower. You have these cards that give you bonuses for visible coral for the most part. So if it says like, if it shows like three diagonal yellows, every instance of three diagonal yellow corals, you can score the amount of victory points it shows. Sometimes it will have like a yellow yellow coral in the number two. So that will be every um, yellow coral at the height of two that you have on your board because you can go up to four as your stacks go. Um, And that's essentially the game. You're building coral reefs with these coral plastic pieces that stack on top of each other. The goal is to get the most victory points. That was a great game. Um, And why don't I just, I'll stop on Stuff of Legend. I got plenty of other games to talk about. So Stuff of Legend is a board game based on a graphic novel that my wife fell in love with like five years ago at a local Comic-Con. She could tell you about the story. I haven't read it. Um, But essentially... You're a little boy who gets lost in this like fantasy dimension and you're trying to escape without getting caught by the boogeyman. And you're befriended by um, these different characters like a teddy bear, um, a rabbit, all these different characters. Uh, Not too different from stuff fables as far as like um, theming goes, but it's definitely darker. Um, The art is super unique. We were also playing a prototype copy um it's by third world games they will be uh, i promise you they will be on this podcast uh to promote it when it comes out on kickstarter next year in fact the guy who i talked to who was demoing the game knew psvg and had intentionally sent us an email that we did not get because i'm assuming it went to the psvg emails at some point and never made never made it to board of the vg uh, but he has our info now Um, He was very excited to meet us. Um, So in this game, you're traveling through different locations, and the locations are face down. You have two different uh, cards on each location. One is like a thematic story to the location, and then the second card is an encounter that you have to do. You also have like armies around you trying to get you and capture you. The cool part of this game is you move as a group. There's a dog that um, reference is like stands for the entire party and the entire party moves as one unit. Um, It also has a wound tracker. So when you take a wound, it works like the outbreak tracker in pandemic. If you take too many wounds, you flip a boogeyman card and then something always bad happens in a boogeyman card. Also, you are traveling in a group and depending on the amount of players there are, you are drawing from a loyalty deck and If you're playing three players, there are four cards. Three of them are loyal to the group, and one is loyal to the boogeyman. If you're playing more, there will eventually be two people loyal to the boogeyman who are trying to cause the team to get caught and captured. There are cards in the game that that just, if you draw this card, it makes you change your loyalty without, you don't have a choice. But people don't know who you are, so it could change you from loyal to the boogeyman to loyal to the group, or vice versa but people still don't know who you're loyal to. And your goal of the game is to find the exit. You have four different exit locations, and then you have seven different tokens that get shuffled up randomly and placed on these locations. And it's kind of tricky the way this works. If you have, uh, when you go to each location and you either secretly 
can look at the location number or you can publicly look at it depending on the scenario. And when you do, if you if you flip over a seven, that is either the exit or if there is a one at the other locations, the one is the exit. But the only way to know that is to find that one first. If you decide, like we, the first location we went to was a seven and I was loyal to the boogeyman. So I was like, well, let's just risk it and go for it. If we had flipped over a one on any other location, we would have lost. Uh, so we went for it. We flipped them all over. There wasn't a one. So unfortunately we escaped. But my plan was obviously to get us caught. Um, super cool, fun game. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it has a lot of promise. Um, the prototype definitely had some things that they were working on fixing. And a lot of pieces were just kind of placeholders for what will eventually be pieces. But I would expect nice miniatures from this. Not too many. You're not talking about like a miniature game. But they should be nice pawns. Uh, production quality will be good. But the storytelling, I think, is where that game thrives. Awesome. So that's what I'll talk about for board games, I think. So actually, when I saw the pictures and stuff of that, my wife has read stuff of Legend. Oh, nice. Um, so yeah, so she was, I was showing that to her a little bit. She was pretty excited about that. So now I'm like, well, maybe I should read these before before we get too much further because she is a fan of those. And yeah, I was pretty stoked to see that. So it was pretty exciting. So. Sure. Final question before we wrap the show up and move on to all the other things we do before we end. PAX Unplugged 2019. Uh-huh. Will you be in attendance? Of course. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I assume the answer was. I said to my wife on the drive home, <clears throat> so what do you think? Do you want to try doing like Dice Tower Con next year? Do you think you want to go and try a different convention next year? She said, no, I like PAX Unplugged. Well, let's go back next year. I said, sounds good to me. Let's do that. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, we will kind of work our way towards the end of the show. Again, Splake, thank you for the questions that you asked. As always, if you do have any questions you want to ask or have us covered during the show, hit us up at Board with VG on Twitter. But that's going to kind of wrap things up for this week. While we're clearly a gaming podcast, we want to give you one recommendation, suggestion, thing we are doing or into that's helping us live a well-rounded life before we leave. Uh, and again, this typically isn't going to be something gaming related, but just something we're enjoying or is giving our life meaning currently. So, Josh, what recommendation do you have for the folks to live a well-rounded life? You know, I'm going to give you a, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> a suggestion or recommendation that I didn't um, follow uh, over this past weekend. There's a lot of people at Pax and Plug that I knew that I just didn't go up and say hi to and like introduce myself to i mean i did to a lot of people but there were at least two times more people that i noticed and recognized um so while i stepped out of my comfort zone for a lot of things um the recommendation that i would suggest to you that i would like to heed my own advice in the future is uh, make yourself a little bit uncomfortable and go go talk to someone that you've wanted to say hi to or talk to that maybe you haven't even if it's over social media um but you don't be afraid to put yourself out there um like i was and uh and yeah make it make a connection um and that's something that i'm gonna take and that's what i think you'll see uh 2019 for board of video games is gonna be a big year i think and and i'm gonna make sure that I am doing my best to contribute as much to that as possible by bringing you guys more guests and more new experiences and more things that Kyle and I can share with you guys. So, so yeah, do something. I think I said this before, but do something out of your comfort zone and, and make a social connection that you, that you were afraid to do before. Excellent recommendation, sir. My recommendation is going to be a little less, uh, uh, a little more down to earth maybe, or a little less uh, profound, I should say. Um, you know, I really enjoy baking. I don't do it that often. It's not something that I, I spend a ton of time on. But as the holiday season has approached, there has been dozens and dozens of cookies made recently in the last week or so. And there are dozens and dozens more to make. And I just really enjoy baking. I like the process of it. It's something my wife and I typically do together when I'm not recording a podcast while she's doing it. But it's just something that is a good thing where you can spend time with other people, do something together. And it's you know, you can have 
In our case, we have a Christmas movie playing in the background, almost always White Christmas, uh, just something on that's kind of in the background, but we're just spending time and enjoying time together. And I think that's going to be an important thing is to find the people in your life that you care about, spend important and good time with them. And that's really going to help you do, you know, I think that's going to go a long way in helping you feel refreshed and rejuvenated because we all know the holidays can be stressful. So mm-hmm. make sure you find those times in that stress to take some time for yourself, connect to those that you care about um, and just make it all a little bit of a better time. And for me, baking is what helps do that. Nice. So with that said, Josh, what do you say we wrap this show up? I think as always, that is a wonderful idea. I did see some more fan fiction, by the way. I know we're going to get to the uh, Gmail, but I saw some more. It's coming along. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Remember, you can find us on all the social medias at Board with Fiji. Uh, use that hashtag, hashtag Board with Fiji. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Board with Fiji. And of course, we're at Board with Fiji at gmail.com. We got a couple more contest entries. Uh, that's going to be done by the time you hear this. So um, hopefully you got those uh, emails in uh, for plugs. Uh, I'm just going to reiterate what we talked about earlier. Um, Please uh, tweet at us, email us, just get in touch with us and let us know what you think will be a good idea for a board game themed um, monthly game night for us. Uh, We want to get you guys either involved or, um, or at least, or, or watching or listening to us do something board game related. So Uh, Let us know, uh, and we promise we'll take everything that you guys suggest uh, seriously, and we'll we'll talk about it amongst ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, You can find me at all the usual places, Board Game Geek, Xbox Live, PlayStation Network, Twitter, all that fun stuff, Instagram, all at Psychocross, C-Y-C-O-C-R-O-S-S. Kind of like Josh was alluding to, if you are listening to this the day this releases, on Thursday, the Game Awards would be tonight. And we are running a little contest for that. So you just need to submit to boardwithvg at gmail.com who you think is going to win game of the year from their six nominees. Again, you don't have to get it correct. Just need to submit who you think is going to win and you'll be entered and eligible to win a prize from that. Next week's show, so one week from today or when you're, yeah, one week from today when you're listening to this, we'll be announcing the winners of both the Game Awards contest as well as the Metafall contest because all of the games from the Metafall contest will have been released. So we'll go through who the won the long, long drawn out Metafall contest and wins their choice of a video game of one of those video games on the list. So those will both be happening next week. In addition to that, we're approaching the end of the year. So we're going to be doing a lot of wrap-ups, reflecting back, looking back on what has now this time been a full year of Board with Video Games. Because, uh, you know, we started like last October, November. So it's been a full year of us doing this podcast this year. So we're going to do some, I don't want to say like end of the year awards or anything like that necessarily, but we're going to be talking about a lot of our favorites. So favorite experiences, favorite games, things like that. So if you have particular things, especially things that are maybe outside of the box that you think would be good things for us to talk about, categories, favorites we should address, least favorites we should address in any category, uh, go ahead, let us know. We want to talk about some of those things if you think things would be interesting. And hey, if you've heard about on different podcasts and you want to know what our opinion is, you can let us know too. That's totally fine. So again, thank you so much for listening, everyone. If you have any suggestions for future topics, Be sure to reach out to us on the social media and remember everyone, whether it be board games or video games, never stop gaming.